I want to welcome you to hearing number nine of the 189th uh, period of sessions. And the title of this hearing is Impact of Uranium Mining on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in the United States. I want to acknowledge representatives of civil society as well as Ambassador Mora and representatives of the state. Um, this morning we have uh, our usual methodology of the hearing. We will allocate the first 20 minutes to representatives of civil society to make the presentation. The state has uh, equal time, 20 minutes. We will have, uh, the commission has 20 minutes to uh, make comments or ask questions. And then we go back to civil society for another 12 minutes and to the state for another 12 minutes. And that's how our time is organized. Before I begin the hearing, I would just like to recall um, and celebrate that the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights is commemorating 65 years of work committed to the defense and promotion of human rights in the Americas and the Caribbean. Since 1959, when we were established, thousands of individuals and groups and peoples have turned to the Commission seeking protection, justice, and reparations. And many states have also turned to the Commission for technical advice on compliance with international human rights standards. So we celebrate 65 years of history. We've had more than 100 on-site visits. The statistics are impressive. More than 1,000 precautionary measures have been granted, over 750 merit reports prepared, 220 friendly settlements, and we hope to move more in that direction, Executive Secretary, and 377 cases have been sent to the court. All of this with the victims as a central focus of our work and our priority. <coughs> and of course, working with states to ensure accountability for, comp for compliance with their international and regional obligations. I also want to say for those who are joining us online on the point of accessibility, to ensure that this hearing is inclusive, we ask all participants to begin your, pre your presentation by stating your name, your position, and the organization or institution you represent. And every time you take the floor, please repeat that, at least your name, so that the visually impaired can identify who is speaking, those who are online. Likewise, we remind you that these audiences also have Zoom subtitles available, as well as interpretation. So every, everyone who's online can activate them directly from your own computer and choose the display size. Um, for those who want to follow us, not on Zoom, but otherwise, we, we are accessible on the um, Inter-American Human Rights uh, YouTube channel, as well as live stream on Facebook. And I also understand live stream on Instagram. Not Instagram, so just Facebook and uh, YouTube. So with that, I would like to turn to representatives of civil society for your presentation. You will see that there is a clock on the screen, which will, you can use that as a guide to uh, making sure that you've completed your presentation in the time allocated to you. Over to you. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, good morning, Madam President and members of the commission. Uh, my name is Eric Jantz. I'm the legal director at the New Mexico Environmental Law Center. The testimony you will hear this morning will bring to light a long overlooked issue, how the U.S. government has jeopardized the inherent rights to life, health, culture, environment, and water of hundreds of indigenous communities across the country in pursuit of a single mineral, uranium. For decades, federal agencies have understood that unremediated and inadequately remediated uranium mines and mills pose a public health danger to those living nearby. For even longer, federal agencies have known that mine and mill waste have contaminated vast areas of land and huge amounts of water. Federal agencies have ignored or suppressed information about the dangers of uranium development. They've dragged their feet on uranium waste cleanup from historic mining and milling in native communities, while at the same time promoting and subsidizing new uranium production in those communities. The U.S. has rarely, if ever, secured tribal consent for uranium production on and near tribal lands. The cost of the government's lopsided policies have disproportionately fallen on native communities. Edith Hood and Teresita Kiana from the Navajo Nation, and from Nebadback from the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe, Carletta Talusi from the Havasupai Tribe, 
Big Wind Carpenter from the Northern Arapaho Nation, and Tanya Stans from the Glala Lakota Tribe of the Great Sioux Nation, will testify about how uranium policies have affected their communities. We have supplemented their testimony with written materials. In our request for this hearing, we identified several recommendations, some of which we are reiterating here today, we asked the Commission to make to the United States. First, we call on the United States to place a moratorium on all new uranium mining and processing on indigenous lands or near culturally important sites until remediate, it has remediated all legacy waste and implemented laws governing uranium development that are consistent with its human rights obligations. We also call on the United States to begin phasing out ongoing uranium mining and processing on indigen in indigenous communities. The only exception to this moratorium would be when an indigenous nation has given its free, prior, and informed consent to develop mineral resources within its jurisdiction. At, uh, free, prior, and informed consent should also, and especially, include the right to say no. Finally, during a moratorium, federal agencies uh, responsible for regulating uranium uh, production and remediation should review and change as necessary their policies and regulations to be consistent with the United States human rights obligations. Thank you and we look forward to any questions you may have. I am from the Red Water Pond Road. Nahastasha Ma is the name we give Mother Earth in our prayers. She provides all our basic needs. Air, water, soil, light, and more importantly, it is our, sh it is our shelter. As the Net people, we are tied to the land in our daily lives. Our concept of hojong is constant in our lives. It means to live in balance, beauty, and harmony. When this balance is disturbed, our way of life, our health, our well-being all suffer. Where I'm from, we grew up with names of our communities, such as Hizdike, or Hizdike, or all in Navajo geographic terms. Our community is next to the number one Superfund super site on Navajo Nation, the Northeast Church Rock Mine. The number three site is the Corvera Church Rock One Mine, which I can see from my kitchen window. It is still yet to be cleaned up to reduce the risk of exposure. Around the corner is the place of the 1979 Church Rock Uranium Tailing Spill, the largest spill of radioactive wastes in U.S. history. Through the years after the mining left, we asked to get it cleaned up, but to deaf ears. Our community people participate in a cleanup Pollute, uh, pollution sampling in 2003 that was being done by the Church Rock Uranium Monitoring Project. The findings from that project finally got the Navajo Nation EPA and the U.S. EPA's attention. But as it is, it is taking a lot of time to do a cleanup. Growing up in the community, I remember riding horses and grazing the, the livestock. When the mines came, our community was forever changed. People began, began to leave after we discovered contamination in the community because we were afraid for the health of the children and then our own. Only two families of the original 11 families still live in the community because of the supposed pending cleanup. We need to be in a safe, secure environment it is our human right. Going back into history, the government established uranium mines in isolated areas with language barriers, no understanding or translation of what uranium is or what radiation is. How do you explain what you can see, touch, or smell? The government was aware of the risk and the dangers, but failed and neglected to inform our people. As it is, the federal government puts its indigenous people at risk, never returning to check on the people in the land. There was no respect for people living on these lands and certainly no respect for Mother Earth. 
Thank you. Good morning. My name is Teresita Kiana from the Redwater Pond Road community on Navajo Nation. Thank you for granting us this hearing so that our community may finally get the environmental justice that we fought so hard for. I fight for my community, my family, and my children's future. I was raised by my paternal grandmother, the late Catherine Duncan, who worked for the Kermagee Mines and later passed away from pulmonary fibrosis caused by her uranium exposure. She taught me all that she could of our language, our traditional values, and our culture. The cultural teachings I know from her are just a tip of the iceberg of our longstanding knowledge our Navajo people have and as first inhabitants of this land. My aunts and my uncles continue to teach me these values, but a lot of this knowledge has been lost due, the, due to the extractive uranium industry. After prolonged exposure to uranium in the home I grew up in, which caused me and my family significant health problems such as cancers, autoimmune diseases, skin issues, liver and kidney diseases, and even learning delays in infants and toddlers. I was displaced off the reservation into Gallup, New Mexico. I knew the move would provide my children with the safest environment free from uranium exposure, but when you move off of your tribal lands, your ability to practice your language and your culture becomes more and more challenging. We stay connected with family and regularly engage in voluntary mutual aid work to support our community and elders in the Redwater Pond Road but continues to be a challenge for my children to speak their language and practice their traditions the way that we would have had if we could safely stayed on our homelands. The uranium mining industry has not only stripped the land of its natural resources, but also poisoned our groundwater and has left radioactive material in open mines in our community. Extractive mining and the United States government neglect of its responsibility to clean up these mines has harmed the land, poisoned our family and communities, and continues to cause harm by forcing us to relocate outside of our tribal communities and lose touch with our language and our culture. We want our voices to be heard and understood. Our community and people deserve justice, not only from the extractive industry, but from the government entities that were involved in the decision-making of mining and milling these lands. Our children's rights to a clean environment have already been affected. Our children's freedom to practice their culture has been impacted before they were born. Thank you for the attention on this important matter. <clears throat> Mike, my name is Anthony Badback from the White Mesa Concern Group. I'm a tribal descendant of the Yumau and Ute tribe. Yolanda Badback is my mother. I was born in White Mesa, Utah, and my people have lived on or near the reservation for as long as I can remember. We are the caretakers of this land and the water beneath it. Just a few miles from my home sits the last operating conventional uranium mill in the U.S., also known as Energy Fields White Mesa Mill. We feel the mill has contaminated groundwater, plants, birds, and wildlife, and that it pollutes the air with radiation. Our ancestors' remains were desecrated to build the mill and continue to be buried radioactive waste near them, which impacts us spiritually. Sometimes when the mill is running, it smells like chemicals near my house. Our young ones are starting to get asthma, and nobody knows why. They never had asthma before. We are concerned about pollution in our well water. Most of us don't drink our tap water. We purchase bottles of water. The water underneath the mill is becoming more and more polluted and is moving towards our community. The acidity of the water is increasing and heavy metals are rising. We used to drink the spring water for our ceremonial purposes. We don't do that anymore. We used to hunt for animals near our homes. We used to gather plants for medicine and for baskets and to eat. We don't do that anymore as well. Radioactive waste and contamination in the lands of the Cherokee, Spokane, Muscogee, and many other nations including international waste from Japan and Estonia, has been shipped to the mill. More waste left behind from the U.S. government could not come, or U.S. waste left behind from the U.S. government is coming in soon. They put tribes against tribes, and we don't support that. 
It's no longer just a uranium mill. It's now acting as a low-level radioactive waste, waste repository because now they're accepting various waste streams. The state of Utah regulates the mill and they keep relaxing their standards so the mill stays open. It's hard to live close to the uranium mill. We want to be free from the fear of getting cancer. We want to spend time outside without smelling chemicals. We want to use spring water for ceremonies without fear. We want to gather herbs and hunt without worrying whether the herbs are safe to use and whether the meat is safe to eat. We're concerned about the health of our young ones and our elderly and our youth community. We want the mill to shut down and properly be cleaned up. We want the mill and its contamination to, move, to be moved where it can't hurt any living things. Doyok, thank you for the opportunity to support my truths about how uranium has affected the White Mesa community. Please help us. We're waiting and wanting justice. My name is Carletta Talusi. I'm a member of the Havasupai tribe. Havasupai means people of the blue-green waters. I am here on behalf of my tribe to provide testimony on the current mining activities occurring on the rims of our canyon home. And it's gonna contaminate our main water source, Havasu Creek. The watershed and the sources of Havasu Creek are located on federal public lands around our reservation. A active uranium mine is also next to our sacred mountain, Red Butte, Wigadwisa, my tribe's creation stories. We have been against uranium mining for decades because of the known risks to air and water, land and people. The federal mining law of the 1872 still allows international mining companies to come onto federal lands such as Pinyon Plain Mine, a Canadian owned business currently conducting mining operations near Red Butte and causing environmental contamination. Uranium mining in the Southwest has scarred and left horrifying legacy of death in our communities. Thousands of abandoned uranium mines on federal and tribal lands have not been cleaned up. Large open pit uranium mines are still highly toxic and not mitigated. Nearby citizens have died of cancer. Uranium will continue to poison the Grand Canyon, including the aquifers that feed into the Colorado River. In 2017, the mining operations pierced an aquifer causing nine gallons of water per minute to leak into the mine shaft at Pinyon Plain Mine. In 2018, 96 million gallons of contaminated water spilled into the shaft. They stored the contaminated water on site. The mining company sprayed the contaminated water into the air to speed evaporation. In 2017, the Arizona Department of Water Resources found the mining company violated state law by trucking this water considered waste material for disposal out of state. The mining company has been cited with 16 violations by the Mine Safety and Health Administration. Recent scientific studies show that aquifers around the Grand Canyon are connected and that the contaminants from uranium mining are likely to make their way to the deep aquifers that feed Havasu Springs. The mine closure is the only way to avoid this risk. This is a serious, urgent case. This is an active uranium mine at the Grand Canyon at the headwaters of Havasu Creek. We respectively request that you urge the United States to change the 1872 mining law to prevent irreparable harm to the Grand Canyon and the Havasupai tribe's sacred waters. We respectively request the commission to present our case to the Inter-American Court to seek an order requiring the adoption of provisional measures to prevent irreparable harm from uranium mining to the Havasupai tribe's waters and sacred sites. Pinyon Plain Mine cannot be allowed to proceed. The Havasupai tribe is in front of the front lines of uranium mining contamination. Hangu. My name is Big One Carpenter. I'm a Northern Rapala <coughs> tribal member. Fort Laramie Treaty lands across the plains and Rockies bear the impacts of nuclear industry. In Arapaho, Wyoming, uranium 
mining and processing poisons the very ground we call home, leaving lasting impacts on our, our sacred sites, water, and future generations. As climate concerns rise, so do the proposals for nuclear energy, and the threat continues to jeopardize our collective well-being. Yet its proponents often silence the voices who have suffered and are harmed by its lasting impacts. They have rebanded nuclear as green, but the damage that is done to our homelands and communities is far from green. Our communities and our lands have endured enough. We demand environmental justice. We need your support to hold accountable those who exploit our resources and oppose projects that harm our people and our homelands. Together, let's ensure a future where our voices are heard, our sacred lands are protected, and a truly sustainable future is found and a solution to the climate crisis is found. Ho ho. Hello, my name is Tokia Glohuniwi, AKA Tanya Stans. I'm from the Pte Oyate who submerged from the, black, from the caves of the Black Hills. I am a full-blooded Oglala Lakota woman from Oglala, South Dakota on the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. I have spent my lifetime traveling within our treaty territory and to sacred sites to practice and use ceremonies as our way of healing. I was raised the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation and Rosebud Reservation share the White River Group aquifer system with Kamiko Crow Butte in situ leach aquifer uranium mine. We are sitting on top of the aquifer system that they're mining. They are proposing to set up another mine south of Crawford called Marsland. We may be the poorest county in the country, but we are rich with our cultural and our spiritual practices. People come from all over the world to share a connection we have with the land, the water, and the silent relatives. The increase of uranium also increases the heat in these ceremonial practices. Increasing the heat makes it more contaminated. This is our church. This is how we heal. Acid leach uranium is one of the, f sorry, we did not have, we do not have any end in sight. The answer is not to open more ISL in situ leach uranium mines. We suffer from high levels of radiation and uranium contamination when we go into ceremony because, the, because of the simple fact that the heat is increased. So inside of those lodges, we are sitting with the increase of contamination in those lodges. We also sit on the ground where the radiation seeps under the ground and we camp and we do our ceremonial practices on the grounds of these, of these uh, uranium mines. The biggest thing that I want to talk about is that the western tribes of South Dakota receive piped in water from the Missouri River. This is supposed to save us because of our uranium contamination, when in fact, we have no filters off our groundwater, and this pipeline water that's coming in off Missouri River is bringing in all the Wyoming ISL uranium mines into our faucets. So we don't have filters to filter that out. And when we go into ceremony, we use that same water, put it in the lodges that increase the heat. So we are suffering at impacts that common, most all Americans do not receive. I ask that you take a look at that and that become part of the um, surveying process of opening up uranium mines. That is never on our, our, our grassroots communities to present that. Um, I'm so sorry, but your time is up. Okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Uh, you will come, you will have another time to speak, I think, for a few more minutes in the second round. I turn over Ambassador Moore to the representatives of the state. Thank you and good morning. Um, distinguished commissioners, secretary of staff, representatives of the organization who requested this hearing, and to all of today's speakers and attendees. My name is Francisco Mora, and I have the honor of joining you here in my capacity as 
ambassador, U.S. ambassador to the Organization of American States. This hearing gives us the chance to hear directly from those who have raised concerns with the Commission about issues pertaining to the United States. Thank you for being here and for this opportunity. At the U.S. mission to the OAS, one of, the, one of our key roles is to foster engagement between our partner agencies and the inter-American human rights system. I am pleased to note that in recent years, the United States has been able to bring appropriate representatives from across our government to speak at hearing and working meetings. To this end, we welcome here today our colleagues from the Department of, of Interior, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, who will share with you the many ways that our government is addressing concerns related to uranium mining. Bureaus in the Department of State have ongoing engagements with tribal nation leaders related to a wide range of bilateral, regional, and multilateral issues. These include transboundary matters such as mining, environment, water, fisheries, and health. We value this continued involvement with tribal nations. Let me now then turn over to the Department of Interior's Assistant Secretary of Indian Affairs, Brian Newland, and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Ambassador. Ani Buju Nogijigad, Yate, Hao, Maiku, Buenos Dias. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Brian Newland. I am Ojibwe Anishinaabe from the Bay Mills Indian Community, uh, which is located in northern Michigan. And I presently have the privilege of serving as the Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the United States Department of the Interior. And I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to uh, speak and testify today uh, on behalf of the United States. As Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs, I serve as a leader for the United States trust and political relationship with tribal nations. The Department of the Interior is at the forefront of reinforcing tribal consultation and consensus and facilitating tribal input into policy development and program implementation. It is fundamental to our belief that honoring our tribe or our relationships with tribes and upholding our trust and treaty responsibilities are critical to achieving our mission. Tribal nations have played an instrumental role in advancing the national security of the United States as well as global safety. As you've heard and as we understand, these contributions include uh, the period during World War II and have included the mining and processing of heavy metals like uranium for nuclear energy and testing of uranium on or near tribal lands. And we know this is especially true for uh, tribal nations like the Navajo Nation, the Western Shoshone, uh, the Pueblos of New Mexico and many other tribes. Today, the process that we use to engage with tribal nations looks much different than the process the federal government used in the past. For example, on January 26th, 2021, President Biden issued a presidential memorandum reaffirming uh, the Executive Order 13175 on consultation and coordination with tribal nations. The duty and responsibility to consult with tribes is not limited to the Department of the Interior, but rather extends to all federal agencies. Federal agencies are required to have a consultation policy to lead them in their engagement with tribal nations and inform their decision making. In March of 2021, the Department of the Interior began engagement with tribal leaders on ways to improve our consultation process as well as to identify best practices and strengthen our relationships with tribal governments. Through these consultations, the department was able to identify and define the hallmarks of proper consultation with tribes. These hallmarks include providing sufficient notice to tribes of the topics to be discussed at consultation and enough details that tribal leaders and their representatives can fully and meaningfully engage with the department. It is also critical for those department officials who will ultimately be making a specific decision to personally discuss the issues involved with tribal leadership. 
It is likewise critical for the department to formally respond to tribal concerns and comments and identify how those comments and concerns were incorporated into our final decisions. It is our policy that consultation is required when any action we are proposing would have a substantial direct effect on one or more tribes, where it would impact the government to government relationship with the tribe, or where it would impact the distribution of power and responsibilities between the federal government and tribes. In many instances, we must conduct outreach to tribes to determine whether any of these criteria have been triggered. While this level of engagement may be time consuming, in the long run, it ensures that the department is meeting its trust and treaty obligations and making fully informed decisions. The Department of the Interior is also leading a new interagency working group on reforming hard rock mining laws, regulations, and permitting policies in the United States which govern uranium mining. Government to government consultation with tribal nations has been a feature of this work. The administration released in the fall of 2023 the Mining Reform Interagency Working Group report with several recommendations for promoting and protecting the interests of tribal nations and tribal citizens. Just as during uh, World War II and other times in the past, we know that tribal nations and American Indian and Alaska Native people will continue to play an important role in the United States national security, as well as our engagement with foreign nations. The United States will continue our work to elevate our relationship with tribal nations as we do so. I wanna say miigwech, thank you again for the chance to connect with you today and for the important mission of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. Good morning. My name is John Lubinsky, and I serve as the Director of the Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards at the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission, or NRC. I am pleased to have the opportunity to speak with you today. The NRC is an independent safety regulator. Our mission is to protect people in the environment. Regarding our roles and responsibilities related to the focus of this hearing, it is important to note that the NRC regulates processing of uranium ore called uranium milling. The NRC does not regulate uranium mining, nor the waste from uranium mining. One of the functions of my office is to provide regulatory oversight of uranium milling facilities. This includes both facilities that are operating, as well as those in decommissioning. The NRC does not propose, site, or operate uranium recovery facilities. They are developed by private entities that must receive NRC approval, along with the consent of other state local and federal oversight authorities. The NRC's role is to determine if such proposals meets the applicable requirements by conducting thorough safety and environmental reviews. During our process for reviewing license applications, we consult with interested tribal nations and offer an opportunity for hearings on our actions. The NRC is also part of a multi-agency effort focused on the legacy of uranium contamination on the Navajo Nation, including remediating abandoned mine sites and former uranium milling sites. The NRC respects the sovereign rights of federally recognized tribes in the development and implementation of agency policies and actions that have implications for tribal nations. The NRC's tribal policy statement provides principles to guide the agency's government-to-government -government interactions with federally recognized tribes. The policy statement also underscores the NRC's commitment to conducting outreach to tribes and engaging in timely consultation and to coordinate with other federal agencies. In 2022, the NRC performed a systematic assessment of how we approach environmental justice in our programs, policies, and activities. The review included extensive outreach efforts to stakeholders including environmental justice communities and tribal nations, other federal agencies, nuclear safety organizations, and the public at large. We found that our approach to environmental justice in our programs, policies, and activities has worked well and, assessed, and the assessment identified opportunities for programmatic and policy enhancements as we move forward. 
Tun turning to our specific role, the NRC has a well-established program for regulatory oversight of uranium recovery facilities. Through decades of rulemaking, licensing, and oversight experience, the NRC has built a program of robust requirements for construction, operation, decontamination, decommissioning, reclamation, and groundwater protection. These requirements ensure safety and protection of public health and the environment. NRC regulations establish technical, financial, and long-term site management criteria for these activities. The NRC can assign certain regulatory authorities to it, cer certain of its regulatory authorities to individual states within the United States. We refer to these as agreement states. And we ensure that they demonstrate adequate and compatible programs to license and regulate some types of nuclear materials and facilities, including uranium recovery facilities. Most uranium recovery projects in the United States are in agreement states. And the NRC ensures these states maintain adequate and compatible programs through comprehensive periodic program reviews. The NRC's licensing process for uranium recovery activities includes both a safety and an environmental review conducted by our technical experts. The NRC staff documents its safety findings in a comprehensive evaluation to determine whether the pro proposal meets applicable requirements. Our environmental review is usually documented in an environmental impact statement prepared pursuant to the National Environmental Policy Act, or NEPA, and it evaluates and documents the potential environmental impacts of the proposed action. This review includes an assessment of cultural and historic sites in accordance with the National Historic Preservation Act, as well as an assessment of potential impacts to threatened and endangered species in accordance with the Endangered Species Act. To start the NEPA process, we have scoping, which is an opportunity to hear from the community and the public at large on what the NRC should consider as part of its environmental review. When we prepare a draft environmental impact statement, it provides our preliminary recommendations on the significance of the environmental impacts. We also issue the draft document for public comment and evaluate all the comments received and include them in our final environmental impact statement. In addition to its safety and environmental reviews and associated outreach, the NRC has an internal adjudicatory process. Through this trial-like process, independent judges of the Atomic Safety and Licensing Board panel hear and decide on concerns of individuals and entities that are directly affected by NRC licensing and enforcement actions. Participants in hearings have included individuals, citizens groups, private businesses, state and local governments, tribal members, and tribal nations. These three elements, the safety re review, environmental review, including outreach and hearing process, are the foundation of NRC's review and engagement for uranium recovery proposals under its consideration. These processes provide robust opportunities for public and tribal engagement. I would like to thank the Commission for the opportunity to speak before you today about the NRC's role for ensuring safety. While the NRC does not regulate uranium mining, we have and continue to work with EPA, U.S. states, and others in addressing legacy mine contamination. The NRC is excited to continue to work with the Navajo, Ute Mountain Ute, Agalala Sioux, and other tribes and stakeholders moving forward. Thank you. Good morning, Madam President distinguished commissioners, and all participants and attendees of today's thematic hearing before the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. My name is Clifford Villa, and I have the honor today of joining you on behalf of the United States Environmental Protection Agency. As Deputy Assistant Administrator, I currently serve as a senior political official for the EPA Office of Land and Emergency Management. My office provides leadership and guidance on EPA policies and programs, including the cleanup and restoration of contaminated lands in the United States. This work includes addressing the impacts of uranium mining on indigenous peoples, one subject of today's thematic hearing. While serving today as political leadership for the EPA, I also approach the subjects of today's hearing from multiple perspectives, including as a native of the state of New Mexico. New Mexico is one of the states most impacted by uranium mining in this country, and also a place with unique geography, history, and multicultural communities. I also come as a scholar 
teaching and writing in the areas of constitutional law, environmental law, and environmental justice. Commitment to environmental justice and to working with tribes and indigenous peoples form long-standing hallmarks of the EPA's work and now express priorities of the Biden administration. In 1984, the EPA issued a policy for the administration of environmental programs on Indian reservations. The 1984 Indian policy recognized the sovereignty of tribal governments and established the system of government-to-government -government relationships that the EPA continues to reaffirm over time. In 1984, 1994, President Clinton signed Executive Order 12898 which among other things directed each federal agency to make achieving environmental justice part of its mission. The same executive order also explicitly provided that each federal agency responsibility set forth under this order shall apply equally to Native American programs. In 2014, after significant engagement with community advocates, the EPA issued a policy on environmental justice for working with federally recognized tribes and indigenous peoples clarifying its mission to protect the health and environment of all indigenous peoples in the United States. In 2023, President Biden signed Executive Order 14096, which builds upon EPA's long-established definition of environmental justice, among other things by emphasizing the importance of considering cultural and subsistence practices. Executive Order 14096 also directs federal agencies to consider measures to address disproportionate impacts to human health and the environment from all federal activities, and including consideration of cumulative impacts and other burdens, including climate change. Without question, the legacy of uranium mining and milling activities in the United States raises serious concerns for environmental justice, with disproportionate effects on tribal lands and indigenous peoples. Given the priority that the EPA and Biden administration places on environmental justice, EPA headquarters and regional leadership and staff have engaged with tribal governments and indigenous peoples to understand and attempt to address their concerns. To maintain continual engagement with tribal governments and members of the Navajo Nation in particular, we also recently established a field office in Flagstaff, Arizona. EPA's work to address mining contamination is supported principally by one federal statute, the Comprehensive Environmental Response, Compensation, and Liability Act, known commonly as Superfund. Superfund implementation is guided by the principle that responsible parties, as defined by the statute, should be required to pay for all costs of cleanup. Otherwise, the EPA may pay for cleanup directly, drawing upon a Superfund maintained historically by federal appropriations, industrial taxes, and cost recoveries. Within and around the Navajo Nation, the U.S. EPA, in partnership with the Navajo Nation EPA, has identified 523 abandoned uranium mines of these, early cleanup actions have already been taken at dozens of mine sites. This includes the Cove Transfer Station in northern Arizona, where 22,000 cubic yards of contaminated materials were removed last year. This year, following community engagement, the EPA expects to select remedies for 10 cleanup actions within the eastern agency of the Navajo Nation. These include remedies for two major sites near the Redwater Pond Road community, the Northeast Church Rock Mine Site and the Covira Mine Site with each site involving the removal of more than one million cubic yards of material. Removal of these volumes of material raises challenges for transportation and disposal. To address that concern, the EPA is engaging with community members, as well as federal, state, and tribal partners to identify transportation routes and disposal options. Of course, this work also entails significant costs. To that end, the EPA has entered into enforcement agreements and settlements valued at over $1.7 billion providing funds to assess and clean up at least 230 of the 523 abandoned uranium mines on or around the Navajo Nation. Additional funding may also be available from the Superfund, especially for sites on the EPA's national priorities list, which may soon include the Lukachukai Mountains Mining District on the Navajo Nation. In addition to the Navajo Nation, many other tribes and indigenous communities have been impacted by the legacy of uranium mining in the United States the EPA appreciates the concerns that we've heard today from members of the Oglala Lakota tribe, the Ute Mountain Ute tribe, and many others. We are aware of many similar concerns across the Western United States, impact, communities impacted by the legacy of uranium mining. These also include many Pueblos in my state of New Mexico, including the Pueblo of Laguna, which is host to the Jack Pile Mine Superfund site. On his first day in office, President Biden signed Executive Order 13990, which provided 
where the federal government has failed to meet its commitments in the past, it must advance environmental justice. At the EPA, we are learning from our past and looking to the future, working to deliver on our mission for protecting human health and the environment for all people, including tribal and indigenous communities impacted by the legacy of uranium mining in the United States. I thank the President and Commissioners of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for the opportunity to address you today, and I look forward to any related questions and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Moore and representatives of the state. And now I turn to the, rep to the commission for any comments which you may have, and I will start with the Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Persons, Commissioner Bulkan. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. And allow me to begin by welcoming both delegations, uh, representatives of the state, uh, and to say that I take as an indication of your, your commitment to this process, the very large delegation and representative delegation that you've brought, as well from the representatives of the affected communities. And I'd particularly like to acknowledge how happy I am to see uh, representatives from the upcoming generation um, for whose livelihood this is all about. So th this uh, really pleases me to see, and I thank you very much. Um, I think it would be very useful for us to begin, or for me to begin, by acknowledging um, some of the basic standards, which I know we're all familiar with, but just to lay the groundwork for what we're talking about here today, um, standards not just of our inter-American system, but also at customary international law, arguably. And, and I'm referring to, for instance, as observed in the Mary and Caridan case, uh, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, um, it's, it's been held by, by this commission that protecting the particular relationship between indigenous peoples and their lands and resources is linked to their very existence and thus warrants special measures of protection. These are basic standards um, that acknowledge the primacy of indigenous peoples in this region and they're a measure of redressing historic injustices, injustices that involve removal from the land and continuing inequalities as a result of this. Uh, it, it acknowledges that failure to, to protect these standards and rights uh, and to respect in particular indigenous use of their lands and, and their ability to live on these lands, whether because they're displaced, as we heard, or whether because of activities, uh, uh, mining concessions or whatever, uh, inevitably subjects them to extreme poverty and precarity with risks to their life, integrity, and most importantly, a dignified existence. And so part of that protection um, would, and respect would include observing the, the FPIC principle, uh, free prior and informed consent, as distinct from consultation. I'd like to acknowledge, uh, and we've heard some of this today, about overlapping jurisdictions. But ultimately, as, as, as these standards acknowledge as well, uh, the state's obligation is to ensure ultimately that its, its systems, however they are divided, are compatible with these minimum obligations. That being the, the legal context, as I see it, uh, I welcome the information from the state uh, about the presidential orders, the, uh, the commitment of the present administration, uh, and your own acknowledgement of the impacts, your very frank acknowledgements of the impacts, historic impacts of mining. I think that this is an excellent start. Um, but reference in particular Mr. Mr. Newland's um, reference uh, acknowledgement of the impact of, of mining in general and the duty to consult um, I, I'm curious as to whether your systems recognize more than the need to consult, but the need for free prior and informed consent um, as distinct from consultation, given the enormous implications that mining and other extractive industries have on the people living in the area, um, particularly as we heard here today. And if not, why not? Uh, we've heard at length about the uh, various regulations and how they've been divided up between uh, various agencies. 
But given the testimonies, the very moving testimonies that we've heard, there seems to be, at least to me, some sort of disconnect um, between these regulations and these practices and what's actually happening. And so one of the things I would be interested in learning is what accountability measures exist. So even though there might be these practices, um, are there any accountability measures where there is the failure to follow them or, or the failure to observe the, these um, regulations? And in that context, by accountability, um, what sort of reparations are provided to these communities? Uh, the agent from the EPA um, mentioned um, specific funds, uh, and very large funds at that. Um, I'd be interested to know whether they are available for these very specific cases that we heard about today. And more than, more than, more than um, clean up, and repairing damage. Is there any provision? I'm not sure that I heard about any provision for benefit sharing. So cleaning up leaves us in the same position that we always were, or, or, or being reactive. But are there any provisions for benefit sharing with communities where the, these activities occur uh, either on or adjacent to their lands? Uh, and, and finally, given your very frank, sir, your very frank acknowledgement of the impact of mining, and, and we've heard, of, of course, first-hand accounts of this, um, what kind of commitments uh, would the state be prepared to make to reverse and mitigate this tremendous suffering that we've heard um, from, from communities today um, as a result of decades of these activities? Thank you very much for your, your, your statements and your, your testimony, and I look forward to your um, contributions. Thank you, Commissioner Bulkan. Commissioner Rallon. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Yo voy a hablar en, en español, así que eh, menciono que hay traducción eh, simultánea. Y quisiera empezar eh, muy rápidamente saludando y dando la bienvenida a la delegación de la sociedad civil y también a la ilustre representación del Estado. Un saludo, embajador Mora, muchas gracias también por acompañar la, la delegación. Y voy a ser bastante breve, pero quisiera hacer dos preguntas, una al Estado y otra a los representantes. He percibido que se han hecho, digamos, eh, aseveraciones de afectaciones muy serias a la salud al agua, a la cultura, eh, que no están siendo atendidas según manifiestan los solicitantes. Y el Estado nos ha dado una descripción muy completa sobre una normativa, una reglamentación y una institucionalidad robusta para poder atender estas situaciones. Y mi pregunta para el Estado sería, dentro de esta normativa e institucionalidad, existen canales de diálogo y medidas coordinadas en este momento para atender parte de las afectaciones que han mencionado en la audiencia. Y mi pregunta a los representantes de la sociedad civil es si en la práctica ustedes han, se han acercado por los canales reglamentarios a activar estos canales de diálogo o intentar estas medidas coordinadas y, y si lo han hecho, ¿cuál ha sido su, su experiencia? Esas serían mi, mis preguntas. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Commissioner Rallon. Uh, Special Rapporteur. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Quiero agradecer a las personas solicitantes, grupos solicitantes, por, por traer nuevamente este tema a la agenda de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos. También agradecer a la, a la distinguida representación de Estados Unidos por su tan documentada presentación en esta audiencia. Eh, me gustaría recordar algunos aspectos, al igual que lo ha hecho el comisionado Vulcan hace unos momentos, 
recordar algunos aspectos vinculados al, al marco jurídico interamericano, a los estándares del sistema interamericano, especialmente relativos a, a la materia empresas y derechos humanos, que dan cuenta de la, de la responsabilidad de los Estados al esta, ejercer sus funciones regulatorias o fiscalizadoras, así como también de las empresas en el marco de sus actividades, de tener en cuenta y respetar el derecho humano a un medio ambiente sano y al uso sostenible y la conservación de los ecosistemas y la diversidad biológica, poniendo especial atención a su estrecha relación con los pueblos indígenas, comunidades afrodescendientes, poblaciones rurales y campesinas. Creo que es oportuno señalar la existencia de una opinión consultiva de la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, la opinión consultiva 2317, que hace referencia a la obligación de los Estados de prevenir, regular y controlar la contaminación ambiental a la luz de las disposiciones del sistema interamericano, interpretando, por lo tanto, tanto la Declaración Americana como la Convención Americana de Derechos Humanos. Me gustaría formular una, una pregunta al Estado y también un, una solicitud al, a, a los solicitantes, a las, al grupo de solicitantes. En relación al, al, al Estado, me, me, me gustaría conocer si en relación a este caso concreto, más allá de lo establecido en términos generales por la normativa, se están adoptando o se piensan adoptar medidas específicas orientadas a modificar las prácticas de evaluación de impacto ambiental, otorgamiento de licencias. Y por otro lado me gustaría enfatizar un aspecto fundamental desde la lógica de los principios democráticos, que es la, la priorización de la participación ciudadana a la toma de decisiones ambientales, dado que las consecuencias ambientales impactan desproporcionadamente en determinadas comunidades, en este caso pueblos indígenas, que la democracia juega un rol crucial para facilitar la participación ciudadana en la toma de decisiones, cómo desde, desde el Estado se está pensando o se está desarrollando esta actividad que garantice una amplia deliberación este, y participación en la toma de decisiones ambientales, específicamente en lo que refiere a estas evaluaciones de impacto ambiental y otorgamiento de licencias. En relación al, al, a los solicitantes al grupo de solicitantes, bueno, mencionarles que desde la Relatoría Especial sobre Derechos Económicos, Sociales, Culturales y Ambientales, tenemos un interés especial en hacer un seguimiento de esta situación este, y les solicitamos que nos, puedan, que nos envíen toda la información que documente esta situación a los efectos de que la podamos tener en cuenta en el marco de nuestra labor de, de monitoreo. Al finalizar la audiencia les proporcionaré los datos de contacto de la Relatoría para que puedan mantenernos informados más allá de, de esta audiencia. Así que esa fue la pregunta para, para el Estado y, y la solicitud para, para el grupo de, de solicitantes de esta audiencia. Muchas gracias, Presidenta. Thank you, uh, Special Rapporteur Polimo. For my part, I want to uh, thank representatives of civil society for bringing this issue to the Commission and also for your representation here today and of course to the rep representatives of the state and I note the, 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 the times that you spoke about the commitment to environmental justice and I very much like the alignment of justice with the environment because I think that's what we're talking about um, here, justice and rights. We have heard and I want to acknowledge Ms. Edith Hood, we've heard from you Ms. Hood that the state at the commencement of the mine, mining of uranium in New Mexico, or so soon thereafter, the state knew of the risk of the mining. Not only of the mining, but also of the disposal of the waste which came out of the mining. They knew of the risk to the environment, and they knew of the risk to the health of those who were working within the mines and within the mills. Yet, that, those risks were not disclosed to the workers. Uh, but the risk is not only to the workers, the risk is to the community, the families who live in the shadows of these mines and these, these waste sites. 
Um, so having regard to that non-disclosure, that historic non-disclosure, we also have heard that there are high levels of morbidity and, and mortality which are related to the contamination of the land, of the soil, of the water, of the air. I think it's you mm -hmm. said, how do you fight something you can't even see? So there's that, that contamination which is historic but it also continues. Um, my question for the state in this context, is there a compensation framework for those who suffered health um, debilitation from working in the mine? And also, is there a, 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 a compensation or reparation framework for the families and the persons who lived and who still live in the areas where there is contamination? I should disclose uh, for full, uh, I should give full disclosure that in fact I was in New Mexico um, in July of 2023 myself and former commissioner uh, Detroit Tina. And it, it, indeed New Mexico is a startlingly beautiful place. Um, it's such a different kind of a, a landscape um, and really wonderful. But there were moments when the, the radiation in the atmosphere was being measured. And I understand, I don't know the science, but I understand a normal level of radiation in life here around six or seven or eight and there were places where we went which were 13 which were 22 and and one I saw no signage about that that this is a site that you know this space please don't please don't visit so my question really is about what is the compensation framework for the workers then and now who are still suffering as well as for the families who live in the shadows and still live in the shadows of the of the waste and um, and also, uh, Mr. Uh, Clifford Via of EPA, I'm wondering, do you, and I think you gave some statistics, but uh, forgive me if I didn't get them all. I understand the range of the, the planning, the, the framework, the, 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 the framework for regulation and for implementation of regulation. But I also want to ask, do you have a database? Is there a database on the number of sites, contaminated sites around the United States? And, is there some sort of plan, um, time-bound plan, about the remediation, the cleanup, or the removal of the waste? And on the removal, I suppose, thinking forward, what is the half-life of, of uranium waste anyways? So you remove it from one place, you take it somewhere else, but it's not that it's safe in that other place. Unless I, 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 it's not safe above ground, it's not safe below ground. Um, and so I think this is a bit of a big challenge um, about how do you deal with that. So I just wanted there's a database of the sites and also a kind of a time-bound planning for um, reclamation and remediation. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, with that, uh, representatives of the civil society, you do have some minutes to respond. Let me see exactly how many, because I've forgotten now. 12 minutes on your side and 12 minutes for the state. Thank you, Madam President, member of, members of the commission. This is Eric Jantz, uh, the New Mexico Environmental Law Center. Um, I'd like to address a couple of points the U.S. government made during its testimony. Um, the first point is uh, Mr. Newland talked about uh, the sacrifices that uh, indigenous communities made uh, during the Cold War um, and before uh, for national security. He also talked about um, the ways in which uh, they look forward to uh, indigenous communities protecting national security in the future. Uh, in, in my view, that sounds a lot like we're expecting, the U.S. government is expecting uh, indigenous communities to sacrifice more in terms of uranium mining uh, rather than uh, addressing the problems that exist currently. Uh, I hope that's not the case, but it, it certainly sounds like that from the perspective of someone who's worked uh, with indigenous communities for the last 25 years. Uh, in terms of uh, Mr. Lubinsky from the NRC's testimony, uh, I respectfully disagree with the assertion that uh, public participation is uh, encouraged and uh, honored uh, at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, I worked with uh, communities for over 15 years uh, on a single adjudicatory hearing before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission 
on an ISL recovery mine. It cost the community millions of dollars. Uh, this was a community that is one of the poorest in the uh, state of New Mexico and in the country. Uh, and that's often the case with indigenous communities across the U.S. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is asking uh, the poorest communities to engage in processes that further marginalize them in which they often aren't able to uh, participate in in the first place. Uh, secondly, uh, with respect to Mr. Lubinsky's testimony, um, there's never been an ISL mine that the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission hasn't licensed. Uh, so there's never been a situation where uh, there hasn't been, where, there, where they've seen enough danger to um, uh, deny a uranium mine license. So uh, I think that that uh, is not the view of a lot of the community folks that uh, live near ISL mines uh, and uh, uranium mills. In terms of uh, Mr. Villa's testimony, Professor Villa's testimony, I certainly appreciate and, and uh, uh, are, we're grateful for the most recent steps that the EPA has, has taken in some cases. Um, unfortunately, uh, it's uh, too late uh, in a lot of cases. Um, there's a graphic in the written materials that we've submitted to you uh, that uh, has uh, uh, very instructive in terms of how the EPA's progress has gone. Uh, in Navajo Nation, there are 524 abandoned uranium mines. Um, zero of them have been fully cleaned up. Uh, four have been uh, taken interim cleanup measures. Um, but at the pace we're going, it'll be another 100 years uh, before uh, there's full remediation. Uh, in addition, uh, the EPA has been sitting on uh, some ISL mine regulations for the last 15 years or so. Um, it's uh, a puzzle to us why those haven't been promulgated yet, but we urge the United States to do that. Thank you. Hello, um, my name is Carletta Tulusi. I'm from the Havasupai tribe. Uh, my tribe has been fighting this uranium mine proposal uh, for many, many years. And um, to answer some of your questions, uh, we have um, written numerous letters to the state agencies and the federal agencies about how they are continuing to permit Pinyon Plain mine, even though they have been operating on an old environmental impact statement Call it, that was approved in 1986. And we've been asking them to change and update uh, their impact, environmental impact statement. The Forest Service has not properly consulted us. When we ask for enforcement and oversight for Pinyon Plain Mine, they say that EPA does not have a jurisdiction, the state doesn't have a jurisdiction, and all EPA says is that it's up to the state of Arizona to determine the permitting process. At this time, there's no enforcement and there's no oversight. And we have been diligently participating in consultation processes. They hear our voices, there's no response. They don't come to our communities. We have to travel to do these testimonies. We have to spend our resources to show up as a tribal government. There is no plans for proper transportation uh, that is going to risk the public uh, in this particular case with Pinyon Plain Mine. And um, an accident is waiting to happen. And we have been diligently as a tribe to participate in all the processes as we possibly could, and we never get a response back. Thank you. Um, I just want to make a response to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. And um, you have actually come out to our community and you experienced the wind at 40 plus miles an hour. And you actually got to see how the community has to deal with the material that was previously pushed into <coughs> a mining area where it just blew right over all of us. And your, your response to that was to just 
leave it there. And that's, you know, that's really disheartening for the whole community. And because we want off-site removal, we want it to be away from our community where we don't have to deal with that. It's, it's really unfair that we have to deal with this and my children have to deal with this. And later on, my grandchildren have to deal with this. Why is the government just feeling like we're disposable? We're not. And I just want to put that out there. Thank you. Hello. I wanted to address the NRC here and also the EPA. Um, when we're dealing with, I'll start with Dewey Burdock. When we're dealing with Dewey, Dewey Burdock, it's never been um, looked at as a super fund. And all that runoff, there's uh, a lot of abandoned uranium towns there, Igloo, Provo, and Dewey and Burdock. And we've been trying to get that looked at as a super fund, and, and it hasn't been. They won't even allow, the, the project manager won't allow the EPA on that land just to look at it. So that's an issue in itself. And when we talk about the ISLs, like every, every place you go look for a spring coming out of that White River Group aquifer is contaminated. And my part is like, you know, they always give us tests back and they say they're natural occurring uranium. Well, we, wanna, we want more radionuclide testing we lack that, and we lack that evidence how it's, those different isotopes are infiltrating our body when we're doing ceremony, because when we're on the ground, you know, Crow Butte, every year we go back there, we camp there, there's many different tribes that go back there, and that's like Devil's Tower. The first acid leach uranium mine in a country is right outside of Devil's Tower, and we still go back there every year, and I tell my people, you know, how it is, it's contaminated. I mean, they don't care. And so that, that type of methodology, that type of house survey, that ceremonial use house survey has to be brought in and that is always ignored on how those impacts are um, getting in our bodies. And this is my daughter that was sitting beside me earlier and now we have to take her back out there to do those same ceremonies. And that's like, you know, as mothers, as grandmothers, that's what we face. How are we supposed to be bringing our children into these ceremonies that are radiating, you know? And, and the very important part about where I come from is like, we're the people that have over 100 sweat lodges. And Hoopa Valley has this great um, water quality standard that addresses that. And our tribes lack that. But we're the tribes that have those sweat lodges you know, Crow Butte water, you know, all this water coming out of the Potter River country. I just wanted to read off these, these, these uranium mines up there. Lass, Lance Ross Mine, Iroquois Christensen Ranch, Nichols Ranch, Moore's Ranch, Smith Ranch, Smith Highland Ranch, Reno Creek, Ludman, Shirley Basin, Lost Creek. And those are all our territorial boundaries. And we still go back there and they still ignore us. Thank you. I didn't say anything about eliminating it or something. Hi. <clears throat> my name is Yolanda Babak. I'm from the Ute Mountain Ute Tribe. That was my son that was sitting here that gave, the, gave our testimony. Um, thank you guys for um, listening to us, for our testimonies that we're all here. We're all different tribes, but we're all you reunite with one, one another, and we, we're sister tribes here, and I'm gonna let you guys know that you know how I feel deep down inside me how I feel living near a radiation um, near um, a meal I lived there all my life I went being transported on a bus to high school grade school and I'm still there I raised my kids there now our future generations being transported the same way I was transported to Blanding we're like only five miles south of um, downstream from the mill. We live on, we have in our community, we have well water. Our well waters are north of our reservation. And all the contaminations and everything that the cleanups and everything are being brought near our reservation. And that's not something that I want. 
I want our community to be free of active uh, radiation. I want our kids to grow up in a good environment to where they won't have to be suffering like the way how we are suffering to this day. And I would like, you know, to let you guys know that we went, I myself, when I was a little bit younger, I went to the NRC radio, Radiation Control Board in the state of Utah in Salt Lake City. I approached them, me and my mother, but my mother's not here with me today. We approached them, we asked them these questions like, if there was any kind of disaster that happened there at the mill, who is the first, what's the first town that's gonna be contact? What they told me was Blanding. Blanding's north of the mill. Then they told us the second town that's gonna be contact is gonna be Bluff. We're right just five miles south of this mill and they, we weren't even on the map. Our little community was not on the map. And that really hurts me really bad to see that they're overlooking us. It's just a small little Ute Mountain, a Ute reservation that's just south of um, the mill there. And you know, our kids are being transported daily on a daily basis. Our community don't have transportation. They hit check to go and buy groceries. I'm so sorry, Ms. Right. Yolanda. Thank you guys Bad for back. listening to us. Thank you. And now I turn over to the state. Thank you, Madam President. Um, this is uh, Francisco Moro, U.S. Ambassador to the OAS. Uh, we'll start with um, Assistant Secretary Newland, followed by Deputy Assistant Administrator Villa, and then Director Lubinsky in our response. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, first, I want to. Um, this is Brian Newland, Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs at the Department of the Interior. I want to first acknowledge uh, and extend my gratitude um, to the representatives of civil society uh, and uh, affirm that we understand uh, the burden uh, imposed on traveling uh, to forums like this uh, to speak. Um, both financially and also just the, the physical toll it takes to travel repeatedly um, and share uh, comments and views and, and want to extend my gratitude uh, to each of you. Um, in in uh, response to the comment, uh, responding to my testimony uh, about future uh, engagement in national security, it was a general comment about uh, tribes uh, participating in the defense of the United States, which uh, is a long and rich tradition amongst many tribes to uh, serve in uh, the military forces of the United States and, and uh, contribute to national security of the United States. Uh, and so that it was a general comment uh, prospectively. Uh, with respect to uh, the commissioner's uh, question about free prior and informed consent and consultation, um, the, uh, the presidential memorandum issued by President Biden in, in 2022 uh, setting forward uh, baseline standards for the United States government on consultation included uh, use of the word consensus um, and that agencies uh, engaged in consultation must work to achieve consensus uh, with tribal nations um, as they're engaged in policy making, which was a large step forward from the United States' first endorsement of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. At the Department of the Interior, that phrase and that term consensus is also included in our agency consultation policy and the, our obligation to uh, seek consensus is greater as uh, we get closer to tribal lands and, and, and the health and physical impacts of uh, tribal citizens uh, within their homelands. And I want to uh, add on top of that that the Department of the Interior recently promulgated new regulations under the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. While not relevant to uranium mining, uh, that those regulations uh, explicitly use the phrase free prior in informed consent when it comes to the research on and display of uh, remains, 
sacred objects, objects of cultural patrimony, and other items subject to that law. And so uh, we are seeing, uh, uh, I think, improvements in that regard. And then uh, lastly, with respect to uh, the commissioner's question on uh, whether there is a forum or a venue uh, for coordination across agencies on matters like this. Uh, the president has established an internal body within the federal government known as the White House Council on Native American Affairs. And th that body is co-chaired by the Secretary of the Interior and the president's uh, director of domestic, the Domestic Policy Council. And I participate uh, in that body and it is comprised of agencies across the federal government to make sure that we are coordinating on um, uh, policy development and actions affecting uh, tribal nations and tribal citizens and that on things like consultation and treaty obligations that there is a venue where federal officials such as myself uh, at the leading edge of our trust and treaty obligations have an opportunity to educate colleagues uh, on the president's standards for consultation and other federal initiatives and ensure that agencies are working together uh, on matters such as this. Thank you. Madam President, commissioners, thank you for the thoughtful questions, and I will attempt to answer as, as many as I can and time allows. And, and thank you to the requesters for this hearing. Um, it, it, it certainly shows the value of, of this opportunity to listen. Um, and I would really welcome more opportunity for following up on more specific questions uh, following the hearing. Uh, Commissioner Bulkin, you, you mentioned a number of, of important items, including the idea of benefits sharing. Um, we do have a lot of funding available at EPA through settlements. Um, they are dedicated to cleanup, and we are talking about a lot of heavy-duty construction. Imagine thousands of trucks that will be required to move materials. The funding that we have that's available for cleanup is, is not for compensation for past injuries, unfortunately. There's other sources, and I'll talk about that in a moment. But um, other ways that we might approach the values of benefit sharing include things such as, as jobs programs. Um, what we're talking about are a lot of construction work, and we want to make sure that the people who have suffered these injuries also have the opportunity to participate in cleanup of their own communities. We want to provide job training. We want to make sure that that work is being managed locally um, and, uh, and keeping those resources in the community as much as possible. We also have other funding outside of the Superfund program. Another program in the United States is known as the Brownfields program that provides funding for cleanup and restoration uh, planning in other communities too. We recently had additional funding in the Brownfields program. That is a program of grants that communities themselves and tribes can apply for. Unfortunately, we have found that it can be very challenging for some communities to go through those grant application processes. We understand that concern and we're working on it. One of the answers to that is what we're calling the, the new, a new program called the Tic Tac, uh, Thriving Communities Technical Assistance Centers. Having real people who can help community members navigate the, the program to, to get resources where they need to go. In New Mexico, there is a real life person whose, whose job it is, the Tic Tac. She's based at, at Las Cruces, New Mexico. I met with her in December and she understands the important responsibility of helping communities connect to federal resources to improve their, their communities. And we really look forward to the success of that program as well. Uh, Commissioner Rallon raised a number of important questions, some concerning uh, how we ad uh, adjust for differences in, in appreciation of culture when we do our work. And I think that's a very important question for us as well. We need to see communities as, as, as rich and diverse and values um, in, in many different ways. I could say that we are working on it. Um, one of the cases that, that EPA supported actually came from New Mexico. Um, it was about how we set standards for water quality in the Rio Grande that runs through the state. And the EPA fought and won a decision for the Pueblo of Asleta, which is the receiving end of contaminated water. And the Pueblo of Asleta had standards for ceremonial use that were protected in court. And that's, that is the kind of respect we want. Um, it, when we think about how we do environmental protection. I also had the recent experience of traveling to Hawaii 
um, the island of Maui that had devastating wildfires last year. And uh, EPA had a significant role in doing cleanup after those fires. And we worked with cultural monitors. We worked with Native <coughs> Hawaiians to help us do our work better. And they taught us many things about the island, about their work and world. And, and in fact, we're taking lessons from many communities now. We need to be open to learning from communities. And when we think we're helping, we know that they may be helping us far more. When um, President Clark mentioned compensation, a very important question as well. There is a law, um, the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, that is designed to provide compensation to some of the workers in particular who have been injured from uranium. Um, we know that there are many people who don't believe that act goes far enough. Um, that is a process that, that is sort of committed to the, our legislative branch. But uh, we hope and trust that that compensation will remain on the agenda. It is certainly an important consideration. There have certainly been significant, significant losses, and that should always be considered. Um, you asked about a database for, for contaminated sites. There are many databases, yes, um, and we could help you connect to some of that information if you need to. And, and, and finally, the, your question about the half-life of, of uranium waste. We are talking about very long-lived uh, materials. Um, my home state of Mexico now hosts one of the very few uh, waste repositories in the country known as the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant that accepts some forms of radioactive waste. It took 20 years or more to develop that facility. Um, it was very controversial at the time. There are very limited opportunities, frankly, for safe disposal of radioactive waste in this country. Um, and that is a real and continuing challenge. Um, uh, Mr. Jantz raised the, uh, the question about cleanup and the pace of cleanup, and he, that is, is spot on. Um, if we imagine that we are going to be removing contamination from a community, we've already heard we don't want to place a burden on any other community when we move it there. Um, and many of the communities around the Navajo Nation are other indigenous communities. We certainly do not want to create a problem for any other of, of their neighbors. Um, we're looking hard at all opportunities for finding safe disposal options. We're looking hard at transportation options. How you move that material really matters. Um, those are some of the conversations that I'm involved in personally and will be committed to um, helping to address in the coming years. Um, we heard many other concerns, and I, I would just say that I really welcome additional information. We have resources. We have people whose job it is to do site assessment, to look at these concerns, and I can help connect those people to the communities that really need help. So thank you for this opportunity to share our additional thoughts, and we look forward to further conversation. Thank you for the questions. This is John Lubinsky, uh, U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. Uh, so let me start. We uh, had a question about accountability and holding uh, licensees accountable, and I will focus all of my comments on milling operations, not the abandoned mines at this point because we don't have jurisdiction there. Uh, we do hold the operators accountable uh, for the activities which they uh, have been approved for. In doing so, we set regulatory standards before we would ever approve a license. Uh, those standards are published either in regulations or in guidance documents which are vetted for public comment and we hold public meetings to receive input on the adequacy of those standards and have outreach to the impacted community about those standards. Uh, we only will license a site if it meets those standards. Uh, the comment came up that we've never denied a uh, license application. Uh, quite honestly, I don't know if that's true or not, or whether we've ever denied one, but I would say as we've gone through the process, uh, we do ask a lot of questions from licensees about whether they're meeting the standards, how they're meeting the standards, what type of assurances we have, and licensees most of the time have modified their applications uh, to put additional controls in place to ensure that they are meeting the standards that are established and we will only issue that license if they meet those standards. Uh, if a licensee is not meeting those standards, uh, we do have tools uh, in place for enforcement. Um, the strongest of which is we could revoke their license and um, require them to clean up the site and go through a full decommissioning. Uh, we could impose uh, civil penalties as well uh, on those licensees as they go forward. Uh, and then I see my time is out, but if you will indulge me for one last point. Uh, I did want to comment on how do we get outreach. I said we do that during the rulemaking process. We do it during establishing our standards as well. 
Uh, also on specific licensing actions, I talked about multiple times that we have outreach, and I appreciate the recognition of the uh, NRC coming out to uh, Gallup for a public meeting, and I would add to that, uh, we were out there long before the public meeting in April of 22. Um, we, as part of our environmental reviews, uh, while not required by the, the by NEPA to hold public meetings, we hold scoping meetings in the area where the action has taken place so that we can go to the communities. Uh, with respect to the activity that was discussed at the April 22 meeting, we held multiple scoping meetings beforehand uh, to get information from the local communities. We traveled to the area to reduce the cost and ensure we could get more folks having input to us. Uh, we held potluck dinners and luncheons in the area uh, to have more informal conversations. Um, during COVID, we extended the comment period on the draft EIS. I believe it was the longest ex uh, open comment period we had on a draft EIS. And we made sure that we addressed all of the comments in our final EIS so that everyone could see how we factored in those comments in making our final decisions uh, before moving forward. Uh, and finally, I would note that the meeting that was referenced in April of 2022, uh, I believe that was the first time the commission, our commissioners, uh, had a field hearing in over 40 years uh, and actually traveled out to the area rather than having a hearing at our headquarters in Rockville, Maryland. We actually traveled to the area so that we could actually see the site and engage with people and it would allow for more people to participate in that hearing. Thank you. So we've reached the end of the hearing. I want to thank uh, the representatives of civil society and the representative state for this very thoughtful conversation. This is not a problem that will go away, thinking just about the half-life of uranium. And so we, we know that there has to be a commitment to centering the communities that live in the shadows of these mines, these waste sites, these mills, and to find some solution that makes sense to those communities because they are the ones suffering the health effects. And it must be quite, a, it must be quite an experience to wonder if you can drink the water, mm -hmm. to wonder if you can breathe the air, mm -hmm. to wonder if you can plant your tomatoes and your celery. It's, it's, you're, you're raising something that is deep and deeply profound. Um, and, and so, as I started off this hearing when I said we are celebrating the 65th year of this commission, the commission really is about listening to the peoples of Americas and the Caribbean speak to their realities and to help the state through our technical advisory services to the extent that we have them, because these are complex scientific and, and, uh, and social and economic issues, to help reach compliance with the standards. And I am heartened, by, again, by the, the, the phrase environmental justice. And we stand here on, uh, as the commission to continue to monitor the situation closely, to receive information, to pay attention, and also to communicate with the state as we need to, to submit um, the concerns of the communities that we are serving. Thank you very much to everyone. And I now declare this hearing closed.